to praise Him. I love to praise Him. I love to I love to praise Him. I love to praise Him. I love to, I love to praise His oh, holy name. Now He's my rock, He's my rock, my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. And He's the will, He's the hope. I know in the middle of a wheel, I know He'll never, He'll never, He'll never let me down. He's just a joy that I have found. Well, uh, hallelujah, uh, hallelujah. Oh, well, I, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I, I love to praise his I'm singing hallelujah, uh, hallelujah. Oh, well, I, I love to praise his name. I'm singing I, I love to praise his oh, holy. Well, now he's my rock, he's my rock, my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. And he's the will, he's the I know in the middle of a wheel, I know he'll never, he'll never, he'll never let me down. He's just a joy that I have found. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah in the midnight hour. I love to praise his name. I'm singing I love to praise his oh, holy will. Now he's my rock, he's my rock, my rock, my rock, my sword and shield. And he's the will, he's the hook. I know in the middle of a wheel, I know he'll never, he'll never, He'll never let me down. He's just a joy that I have found. Well, uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise his name. I'm singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I love to praise his name. I'm singing, I love to praise. Well, now I love to praise. Well, I love to praise his holy name. All right. When we reach that journey, no, city. There you go. Thank you, Brother Riley. Brother Riley got me straight. Let us stand. When we reach that city of New Jerusalem, yes, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and by will. How the ransom singers will together lift that hymn. Yes, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and oh, oh, what joy, oh, what joy. Yes, when we get home, yes, we're going to rest beneath, we're going to rest beneath that cloud in that land, in that land where the sand never dies yes we're going to sing hallelujah sing hallelujah by and by will victory and love will be our everlasting theme yes we're going to sing hallelujah sing hallelujah by and by will praising our redeemer there beside the crystal stream. Yes, we gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and whoa, what joy, whoa, what joy. Yes, when we get home, 
Yes, we're gonna rest beneath, we're gonna rest beneath the cloud throne in that land, in that land where the saints never die. Yes, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and oh, oh what joy, oh what joy. Yes, when we get home, yes, we're gonna rest beneath. We're going to rest beneath the cloud throne in that land, in that land where the saints never die. Yes, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah by and oh, oh, what joy, oh, what joy. Yes, when we get home, yes, we're going to rest beneath, we're going to rest beneath. Beneath, beneath the that cloud, they're on in that land, in that land, land, in that land where land. the saints never die. Yes, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and oh, oh, what joy, oh, what joy. Oh, what yes, joy when we get home, yes, we're gonna rest beneath, we're gonna rest beneath the cloud, throne in that land, in that land where the saints never die. Yes, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Once again, we have become the express recipients of another manifestation of God's marvelous grace. Truly, God has been good to us, certainly better to us than we've ever dared to be to ourselves. It is just so marvelous to know that the God we serve, he's not good some of the time. He's not good most of the time, but he's a show enough God because he's show enough good all the time. Didn't he put you to sleep last night? Watched over you all night long. And didn't he touch you with the fingertip of love? Cause you to knock the sleep from your eyes? And hopefully you're going about his business in your right mind. If you think it was your alarm clock that woke you up this morning, I double dare you. I triple dare you. I quadruple dare you. Take it to the cemetery and see how many folks get up. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. I'm looking at some faces around the house and some of y'all look like you don't think God is good. I mean, if you don't think God is good, just try to live without him. See, sometimes we think we're doing it of our own volition, but it's the Lord who's watching over us. Anybody can praise God when the weather is nice, but God is looking for folk who can praise him in the midst of the storm. Anybody can praise God when your gas tank is full. God is looking for some folk to praise him when you're running on fumes. Anybody can praise God when you got plenty of money in the bank. God is looking for some folk who can praise him when you don't even know how you're going to pay your mortgage. Anybody can praise him when you're healthy. But God is looking for some folk who got some bad news from the doctor this week. In spite of your prognosis and diagnosis, you can still praise God. The problem with the church is we got too many fair weather saints. They just want to praise the Lord when everything is well in their life. But God is looking for a few saints who can say, no matter what's happening in my life, no matter how bad my circumstances might be, I'm going to praise God anyhow. I mean, some of us look like we might be experiencing some turbulence this morning. But I'm here to tell you, God is still good all the time. And all the time, God is good. I'm reminded of the story of the plane that was flying through Alaska on its way to Anchorage. And the plane started having some mechanical problems. And it only had four passengers on the plane, not counting the pilot. 
And the pilot said, listen, I've got to crash land this plane, but I only have three parachutes, but I got four passengers. One passenger was a well-renowned cardiologist, and he said, listen, if you don't mind, I got a lot of patients that need me. Can I get the first parachute? Because there's so many people depending on me to save their lives. And so he took a parachute, and he jumped out of the plane. And then the second man said, listen, I'm one of the smartest men on planet Earth, and the, my nation needs me. Can I have the second parachute? And so he took the parachute, the second parachute, and he jumped. And the third man was an old gospel preacher. He had just completed doing a gospel meeting. Many souls had responded to the gospel. And the last passenger was a Boy Scout leader. And the old gospel preacher said, listen, I've lived a long time. And the Lord has been with me all the days of my life. If I die, I'm going to heaven to be with the Lord. So why don't you take the last parachute? And the Boy Scout leader said, we still have two left. And the preacher said, how can we have two parachutes left? And the Boy Scout leader said, we're the smartest man in the world, took my backpack instead of the parachute. So we got two left. You don't have to be smart when it comes depending on God, just trust God to take care of you in spite of what you're going through. How many of y'all got your Bibles? Hold your Bibles up if you got it on your phone, if you got it on your pad, if you got it old school, amen, amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Paul said it's profitable for doctrine, that's what's right. Profitable for reproof, that's what's wrong. Profitable for correction, let you know how to get right. Profitable for instruction, let you know how to stay right. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then he went on to say, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing in kingdom. He said, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn their ears away from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof that ministry. It behooves us to stand on the Bible, the word of God. No matter what you're going through in your life, you need to stand on God's word because the Bible is right and it cannot be wrong. And if you're visiting with us, no strangers in the house, just friends whom we have not met. Now, I don't want to hold you long, but I do want to hold you strong. And I want you to turn to the text, 1 Samuel chapter 17, that was read so wonderfully you're hearing by Brother Sanders. And I want us to pick up at about verse number 8. And I want to reread the text so that I may particularize and emphasize the things I want to make known unto you this morning. And like most of the parents in the house, I'm excited to have my daughter, who's a graduate now, in the house. Some of you all have not had a chance to meet my old, our oldest daughter, Amber. Amber, will you please stand up so everybody can meet Amber. Praise God, she graduated, and I'm so excited. Amen. And for all the graduates in the house, we are so proud of you. If you're there, say amen. First Samuel chapter 17, and I want us to notice verse number eight. And Goliath stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he shall be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I shall prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. I want to continue to speak 
as a spiritual guy with this thought in our mind. Releasing the champion in you. Releasing the champion in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's a champion in you that needs to be released. I don't know what it is about church folk. They act like they don't want to talk to one another. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor, there's a champion in you that needs to be released. See, that person, they must have stayed out late last night. Now talk to the person in front of you. Say, neighbor, release the champion in you. But y'all just going to act phony up in here today. Look, just talk to yourself. Say, self, there's a champion in me that I need to release. When the Heisman Trophy was awarded, for me, it was really one of those uneventful ceremonies. When I began to watch this event unfold on television, I knew who the three nominees would be. I even knew who the winner would be even before it was announced. I already had a premonition as to who would win the Heisman Trophy. However, before the three nominees were announced, the commentator began to talk about the common denominator that existed in all the winners from the past. And the common denominator was that he said they were all champions or that they had the heart of a champion. And what struck me about that statement, about that particular comment, is that when I began to peruse all those individuals who had won the Heisman Trophy in the past, I began to realize that many of them had never won a championship. And many of them had won the Heisman, but they had never won a championship. And only one of the present nominees would be playing for a championship, but as of yet, he had not won a championship, but yet the commentator said they all had the heart of a champion. And I began to think that there must be more to being a champion than winning in a competition. And then my theological antenna began to, began to rear up and I began to allow the Spirit of God to reveal to me that a champion begins with your heart. And even though these individuals may not have won a championship on the field, yet all of them had the heart of a champion. You are a champion not because of what you've done on a field of play. You are a champion based on how you think, how you act. Solomon said, as a man, as a woman, think it and his or her heart, so are you. And when we read the word of God over and over and over again, we find that there are many biblical characters and personalities throughout the Holy Bible who exhibited the heart of a champion. Such is the case of the young man that's on the stand today by the name of David. And in the text that we read and you're hearing today, David exhibits and demonstrates the spiritual characteristics of a champion. Now it's interesting to, me, interesting to me that in the story of David, that where we first meet him in verse four, that Goliath is referred to as being a champion. And the reason I bring this up is because we use the word champion today in our culture and in our vernacular in different ways. But we need to understand the way champion was used in the ancient days of warfare. So let me help you understand the term as it was used in ancient military warfare. A champion in ancient warfare was the person within the army who could individually determine the outcome of the battle. Stick with me. The champion was the person in the military who alone could determine the outcome or who would win the battle. David exhibited the attributes of a spiritual champion. And in this text, I'm going to show you how David was the true champion and not Goliath. In the text, we see that the Israelites are on one side of the valley in the Philistines on the other side of the valley. And when the armies would face off, they would face each other and at the proper time, they would engage in battle. 
Now usually it would start off with a conversation between the warlords of both sides. They would meet in the middle of the battlefield. They would have a discussion to determine how the battle was going to go. And they would come into agreement. And if they could come into agreement that their warlords would fight, then they would go back to their respective armies and send out their warlords. But if they could not come to an agreement, then that would mean that the entire armies would have to fight one another. And so they would go back to their respective sides and say, put on your armor. Gird up your might because we are all going to fight today. But in this particular text, we see Goliath challenging the nation of Israel to send out a man, to send out their champion to fight him. Now, there was always one option that could be exercised, and that option is send out your man. We'll send out our man. And that individual would single-handedly determine the outcome all by himself. He was the biggest. He was usually the baddest and the most intellectual one when it came to the art of warfare. That's why in the text, you see Goliath saying, come out, send me a man. What the Philistines were saying is, there's no need for everyone to fight. There's no need for everyone to die. Just send out your champion, and he'll fight our champion. And if your champion wins, we'll serve your God. If we win, you'll serve our God. Understand something. This battle is not even about the Philistines and the Israelites. This battle is really about God. It's about their God versus the God of the Philistine. And even today, God is looking for some champions. God is looking for someone in the body of Christ to stand up and say, Lord, if you send me out, we will be victorious because I am a champion. So he said, if our champion wins, we will serve your God. Can you just send out one man, and I dropped by to tell somebody today that God is looking for some champions today. He's looking for somebody today who will represent the entire army. He's looking for some people today who will take the authority of faith and say, God, if you use me, we will be victorious. And the owner, the ownership of that particular authority needs to stand up and say, God, I am your champion. God is looking for somebody who would take the responsibility to say, if you use me, it can be done. If it's left up to me, I will get the victory. God is looking for some champions who can represent the entire church. What the army can say, that is the person that we're dependent on to go out and fight our battles for us. Are you the champion in your family? Are you the champion in your community? Are you the one where the entire family does not have to fight, but the father will become the champion and fight for the family? Where the men will become the champion and fight for the community? And you can determine the victory based on the authority that God has placed in you? Now, what that means is a champion is someone who's not always dependent on someone else to get things done. A champion is somebody who doesn't always need the elders to help him or her get things done. What God has done for them, they say, use me and I can make the difference. Because that's what God is looking for. God is looking for some believers who have the heart of a champion in every area of life. God is looking for individuals who are champions with their families, champions with their finances, champions within their friendship circle, champions who are entrepreneurs in the community, champions on the job, champions in your ministry, champions in every aspect of life, and even champions in the church. And I'm not talking to anybody in the house today. And let me tell you something. Champions are not just winners with a trophy. But champions are people who take personal responsibility for success. 
A champion is someone who takes personal responsibility, not only for their own success, but they take personal responsibility for the success of others. See, you're not a champion when you just make yourself successful. You are a champion when you are successful, but you help other people become successful as well. When you are a champion, that means you take the responsibility to make sure that your children are successful, that your marriage is successful, that your family is successful, that your friends are successful, that your church is successful. If you are just successful by yourself, that's selfishness. But a champion does not just look out for himself and herself, but she looks out and he looks out for the success of of everybody else and if you are a champion in here today you ought to be able to say if I'm on the team I will raise the team up if I'm in the group the entire group gets better if I'm on the staff the entire staff gets better and the question on the floor this morning is are you the kind of person who changes the game for the better when you show up Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. One of the greatest comments and compliments he ever received was, not only was he a great player individually, but Michael Jordan was a champion, not because he scored a lot of points, but because when he got in the game, the game changed when Jordan got on the floor. Are you the kind of person that when you show up, everything in the game got to change because you showed up? And is there anything in you that says, I'm the one who's going to make the difference? Is there anything in you that says, if I join the team, then we can't lose? Is there anything in you that says, if I join the team, we already got the victory? Because when I became a part of the team, I made the whole team better. See, it's not just about you making yourself better. It's about you making the whole team better. And see, if you understand spiritual warfare, you might call that ignorance if you don't understand what I'm talking about. But if you understand spiritual warfare, do you understand that it's not you being arrogant, but it's about you having confidence in God and what God has gifted you to do. Dale Crest, God didn't send me here so that I could just be your champion. God sent me here so that I can do my part to help you do your part. What good is it for me to stand in the rostrum and try to preach my heart out if in my preaching I don't make the church better? What good is it for the elders to shepherd the flock if they don't make the flock better? What good is it for the deacons to serve the flock if they don't make the flock become servants themselves? It is the responsibility of a champion to lift the team up a little bit better. It is responsibility of a champion that when he enters the game, when she enters the game, the game changes because a champion will change the atmosphere. Because God has anointed you and filled you with the Holy Ghost for you to make a difference. Tell your neighbors and neighbor, I'm a champion and I can make a difference. He didn't save you so you could get the glory. He didn't save you just so you can die one day and walk the streets of gold. He saved you and anointed you so you can make a difference in the world. But if you're going to make a difference in the world, you got to make a difference in yourself. And when there's a difference made in yourself, you can make a difference in your family. If you make a difference in your family, you can make a difference in your community. If you make a difference in your community, you can make a difference in this city. If you make a difference in this city, you can make a difference in this state. If you make a difference in this state, you can make a difference in this nation. If you make a difference in this nation, you can make a difference in this world. But you can only do that when you have the heart of a champion. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, he preaching to me. You need to make a difference on your job. You need to make a difference in this church. You don't need to just show up on Sunday morning so you can be entertained. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to keep you up. 
I am here to encourage you to be all God would have you to be. If you just want to come to worship and get all excited and then you leave worship and do nothing, then you don't have the heart of a champion. But when we come here, we worship. But when we leave here, we work. And God is looking for some people who will come out on the battlefield and say, if the battle is going to be won, then Lord, use me. I'll be your champion. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, let me ask you a question. Are you a champion? See, you've got to be the champion that makes a difference. And if the devil wants to win, you ought to be able to say he's going to find another way. Because if he wants to win this battle, he better keep me out of the game. But the devil made a mistake this morning. He let you get up in your right mind, put on your dress clothes, go down to the house of God, get a word from the Lord, and now you have refueled your tank and you're going to leave here on fire for Jesus. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm a champion. I'm going to make demons run. I'm going to make devils mad because I am a champion. And when I get in the game, I'm going to make a difference. I mean, do you ever look at your life when the devil thinks he's got you down and you say to yourself, devil, you made a mistake because if you ever let me get up from this, devil, you are not going to know what hit you. Because God and I will make a difference. David is a champion. And what's interesting about this is David has the heart of a champion, but David is not even a, an experienced warrior. David has not been to war college. David is just a little young man who's nothing but a shepherd boy. But look at the text. There were warriors out there who were dressed for battle, but they were scared to fight. Oh, how sad it is to see those who are trained in the art of military warfare, and they are dressed for battle, but they are scared to fight. And I'm looking at some of you all this morning, suited and booted, dressed for battle, but scared to fight. Ain't gonna sweat, ain't gonna mess up your nails, but if we are going to make a difference in Dale Crest, if we're going to make a difference in San Antonio, we cannot come in this church, sit on the pew of do nothing, and whittle on the stick of do even less. If we are going to be what God wants us to be, then we've got to rise up and demonstrate that we are champions and we can make a difference in this world. As a matter of fact, David was not even sent down there for battle. David was sitting down there with some cheese and crackers to take care of his brothers. Eliab, Shema, Abinadab. They were all dressed for battle. They were the older brothers. They were trained in military warfare. But they were standing around with their knees knocking just like everybody else. Tell your neighbors a neighbor. I'm scared, but I'm going to the battle anyhow. And in verse 24, David sees how they're responding. The Bible says all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, when they saw Goliath, when they saw the giant, they fled from him. And the Bible didn't say they were just scared. It said they were exceedingly afraid. See, fear. As an acrostic is false evidence appearing real. But faith as an acrostic is forsaken all, I trust him. And any time you have faith and fear in the same vacuum, one will cancel out the other. The men of Israel were walking in fear. But David came down to that battlefield walking in faith. And faith does not mean the absence of fear, but faith will hope help you to overcome whatever it is you are afraid of. As a matter of fact, courage, the word, the Anglican English word really means to cure your rage. Courage is the cure for rage. 
When you go into a situation where you're being challenged, it does not mean you're not afraid. It just simply means in spite of how you feel, you're going to go into that battle realizing that if God goes before you, you cannot lose. David went to the same battlefield that his brothers were on, but the difference is David went down there in faith. But his brothers were walking in fear. And if we just have a few folk in the church that's got the faith that David has, I guarantee you we will change the complexion of Dale Crest. We will take over this community in such a way that folk will know there's a church in Dale Crest that loves this community. And they're not just staying in the building, but they're reaching out to us in love. They're reaching out to us by serving us. When folk are hungry, champions need to feed them. When folk need clothing, champions need to dress them. When folk have health concerns, we need to get these nurses in here to put together a health care fair and reach out to these folk, give them free blood pressure readings, give them free medical advice be able to reach out to their families, reach out to their children. We need to become the community center here and champions, when you do that, you're making a difference. He's there just to deliver cheese and crackers. And it might be that God has so positioned you to cause the champion in you to rise. God will put us in situations where he will either force us to allow the champion in us to rise or he will cause the champion in us to rise. And when you serve the Lord, you got to ask yourself, are you a champion or a champion? Are you a pretender or a contender? I mean, are you going to walk in your faith or are you going to walk in your fear? When we do this crusade, we're going to reach out to some folk. And we're going to go in communities that we're not comfortable with. We're going to need some champions. We're going to need some folk to overcome their fears and just talk to folk about Jesus. But beyond the crusade, we need to get in the habit of doing that as a church on a regular basis. The elders, we're not going to put you all in a situation where you might be compromised. We're going to look out for you. We're going to provide security. But we're just looking for a few folk who would take off their high heel sneakers and put on some regular sneakers and roll up your sleeves and go out there and share the gospel with somebody. See, the question I want to ask you is, when was the last time you led someone to Christ? Because champions lead champions to Christ. When was the last time somebody became a member of the church because of you? When's the last time somebody became more productive in the church because of you? Champions change the atmosphere. And David, when he went down to the battlefield, David wasn't going down there to fight. He was going down there to deliver cheese and crackers to his brother. But when he got down there, in the midst of the fight, something rose in him. David said, I can't leave this situation the same way I found it. I can't leave everybody busted and disgusted. I can't leave everybody in disarray. You see, when you are a champion, when you start to look around at your family, when you look around at your community, when you look around at your church, when you look around at your friendship circle, especially those folk who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there ought to be something that rises up in you that says, I can't leave everybody broke. I can't leave everybody depressed. I can't leave everybody in dismay. I can't leave everybody in the same situation I found them. Something ought to rise up on the inside of you and say, as a champion, I got to leave this situation better than the way I found it. When that train wreck took place, the champion in you ought to be crying for those eight souls that lost their life. 
when tornadoes hit this area and we have an opportunity to minister to folk whose homes have collapsed when floods come about and people's lives are, are literally underwater the champion in us ought to rise up and say what can we at the Dale Crest Church of Christ do to change the atmosphere tell your neighbor say neighbor I can turn it around because I'm a champion I know this lesson is hard for some of you all because you just want to come to church and hear the preacher talk about how you can be blessed but how can you be a blessing to someone else and 99 percent of us are only where we are because when we were down somebody picked us up and is there anybody in here who knows that the only reason you are where you are is because God sent a champion to help you when I was in the army at the age of 21, doing things I shouldn't have done. I was at the lowest point of my life. I didn't know my barrack sergeant was a member of the Church of Christ. I'd never heard about the Church of Christ. I was raised Southern Baptist, and like most Southern Baptists, I only went to church Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. I was a CME. But I was really down and I was playing my music real loud because I was full of some stuff that I shouldn't have been full of. And the walls next to me, in the dorm next to me, I know the walls were, were, were trembling. And my barracks sergeant lived right next to me. And he came to my door and he began to hit on the door real hard because my music was so loud I couldn't even hear him. And I began to hear this boom, 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 boom. And I went to my door to open it and I called him a few things, looked him up and down and said, who are you knocking on my door like you crazy? But he didn't respond to my foolishness. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. He said, son, are you all right? He said, look, you look like you're hungry. And of course I was. And he took me to town. And he bought me these ribs from the best rib place in Washington, D.C. And I was really down. I was depressed. I was at the end of my rope. I couldn't even tie a knot and swing. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. But in retrospect, looking back, I know what it was now. I needed Jesus, but I didn't know I needed Jesus. And he began to talk to me about the Lord. And we drove back to Fort Myers, went back up to my barracks, and he sat down and I had a little pocket New Testament laying on my nightstand that I'd gotten as a gift in the sixth grade that they gave out to all the kids. At that time, they allowed you to have Bibles and you could pray in school. And so they gave all of us a little pocket New Testament. And I had various passages circled that I didn't understand and I wanted to understand. And this man opened up my Bible and he began to talk to me about those passages. And as he began to talk to me, he began to explain them to me. And I was amazed. I said, are you a preacher? How do you know your Bible like that? He said, son, I'm just a member of the Church of Christ. I said, what church is that? I never heard of it. He said, well, if you'd like to know more about this church, I'd like to study with you. He said, come by my room tomorrow, and I'd be happy to study with you. Well, I'm a masculine, manly man. I didn't want my buddies to see me going to the barrack sergeant's room because I didn't want them to think I was a chump that I was giving it. We used to make fun of him. We used to call him names. We thought he was strange the way he carried himself, but we didn't know he was a Christian. And I was afraid my friends would see me and they would stigmatize me because of the things we said about him. I didn't know he was a champion. I went in there and he started explaining to me about the church of Christ. How there was only one church in the Bible. I said, no, nah, my church is in there. I'm from Mount so-and-so Baptist Church. I know it's in there. Didn't know anything about the Bible. He gave me a concordance, told me to go read it and find my church in the Bible. He explained to me how concordance worked. And sure enough, I took the concordance and I found Baptist all in that concordance. I was ready to come back the next day and blow him out of the water. And he explained to me that Baptist there is referring to John the Baptist, which means John the baptizer. And that John the Baptist was not, was not even a member of the church. 
But in Matthew chapter 14, John was beheaded and he was dead and he was buried by his disciples before Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 upon this rock, I will build my church. And then he said John was not even a member of the church when Jesus prophesied that he would build it. Now I got a little indignant. I was upset. You mean to tell me that uh, uh, you're trying to tell me that my church is not in the Bible and that my mama's wrong? My, he said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I, he said, well, show me your church. I said, show me your church, brother. He opened up the Bible, took me to Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with a holy kiss. Churches of Christ salute you. He said, that's my church. He had me. It led to a two-month-long Bible study. This man began to explain things to me in the word of God that I've never seen before. What I needed to do to be saved. And I would go to church with him. And when I went to church with him in D.C., I immediately said, where is the guitar? Where is the choir? Where is the piano? Y'all can't afford one? I'd be happy to make a donation. <laughs> that led to another Bible study. And he began to explain to me why we don't use instruments of music in the church. And then he began to explain to me the plan of salvation. I asked him why the preacher doesn't call himself reverend. Why y'all call him brother? And he took me to Psalms 111 and verse 9. How God sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant. Holy and reverend is his name. This went on for two months. I was becoming more and more convicted. And this man began to share the gospel with me uh, even more perfectly. He was strong in his belief. And then August 24th, 1980, without him even knowing, the night before, I, I threw out all my cigarettes, threw out all the stuff I had in my refrigerator I didn't have no business having. I got rid of all of it. That Sunday morning, the preacher gave the invitation. I walked down the aisle, made my confession, because this champion took the time in spite of how rude I was, in spite of how I cussed him out, in spite of what I was smoking and drinking, this champion knocked on my door, took the time to share with me out of love the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I got baptized that morning. First time I went under, I didn't go all the way under. So they took me under again. And when I came up out of the water, I said to Brother Maiden, I'm going to preach the gospel because this champion made a difference in my life. And the first person I reached out to was my mother. She obeyed the gospel. My sisters, my brothers, they obeyed the gospel. My nieces and nephews, they obeyed the gospel because a champion made a difference in my life. I wanted to be a champion and make the difference in somebody else's life. Question, whose life are you making a difference in? Last year, I was conducting a gospel meeting. I had not seen Sergeant Bradley in over 30 years. He taught me the gospel. We were together for a whole year. He got orders to go to Korea, and I've never seen him since then. And I was preaching a meeting down in Florida, and I began to share this story. And there was a sister in the audience. She heard my story, and she said, wait a minute, I think I know the person he's talking about. He lives down here in Gainesville, Florida. And she went to Brother Bradley, and she said, Sarge, the man that you led to Christ over 30 years ago, his name is Jerry Houston. He's conducted a gospel meeting at our church. I believe it's the man you led to Christ that you've been telling us about. That night, unbeknownst to me, after 30 plus years, Sergeant Bradley was in the audience and he said, Jerry, I can't believe what God is doing in your life. I said, Sergeant Bradley, he's doing it because you took the time. In spite of how rude and crude I was. In spite of what I had been smoking. In spite of what I had been drinking. In spite of the fact that I cuss you out. You showed me kindness, and you shared the good news with me. 
and for 30 plus years I've been telling everybody I come in contact with that I'm just a nobody and I met somebody and I got to tell everybody that he can save anybody. Dale Crest, I don't want to just be another preacher in this poor pit playing games with you. I'm looking for some champions. I'm looking for champions to be elders and deacons in the church. I'm looking for champions to be evangelists in the church. I'm looking for champions to be on the soul winning action team in the church. I'm looking for champions to be a part of the singles ministry. I'm looking for more champions to be a part of the marriage ministry. I'm looking for young people who want to step out of their comfort zone and be champions when it comes to our youth ministry to work for Brother Dave. I'm looking for folk who want to get off the pew and get in the game and make a difference I'm looking for some champions and if you think I'm talking to you if you think I'm looking at you I am if you think I'm talking to you I am God wants some champions will you stand up will you be one Will you take this church back, not to its former glory, but take it beyond its former glory, and let's go to some new heights? Will you be that champion, young lady? That giftedness you got, will you be a champion? My wife, over 10 years ago, Debbie's always been a very quiet woman. Of course, you wouldn't know it if you've ever heard her speak at a woman's program. And when I met Debbie, we were in college. I know she looks like a little kid, but she just got it like that. What can I tell you? I got it like that. <laughs> but when we met at Northeastern Christian Junior College, she was not a member of the church. And the folk in the Church of Christ turned her off. She really didn't want to have anything to do with Church of Christ folk. Because one of the things we do, we just tell folk they're going to hell first thing we do is tell folk your church ain't right and you're going to hell you, you know you can't you can't come at folk like that and she was like my little sister and she would come to me and talk to me about whatever problem she was going through I would pray for her I would spend quality time with her I didn't just do it for her I did it for any of the young people on campus I was 24 years old when I started going to college and so I looked like I was one of the professors and everybody came to me wanted to talk And she was one of them. But over time, she came to the Lord. One Wednesday night, she was baptized into Christ. And we've been married for 10 years or, or more. And Debbie's always had that quiet and meek and humble spirit. You wouldn't even know how powerful she is because she never makes a fuss. At home, she'll cook dinner. She'll bring me my plate. She's a servant. You see in the kitchen here working. She's always been that way. People say, I've never seen a minister's wife as beautiful and as humble as your wife. Well, over 10 years ago, somebody asked her to speak in a ladies' day. And, you know, when she first started, she said, honey, what this word mean? What that word mean? Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Of course, now she don't ask me for help at all. <laughs> and the first time she got up to speak, we were in Huntington, New York, and I was speaking to the young boys, and she had a house full because she was speaking to the ladies and the young ladies. And I heard all this clapping and excitement going on over there, and the boys were just sitting around. Mm -hmm. But they were having church. And when it was all said and done, the women were like, oh, your wife is powerful. She was, uh, now, I'd never heard her get down like that. I knew she could teach, she knew her Bible. My point is this, the champion was always in her. And when God provided her with the opportunity to allow the champion to come out, God showed up and showed out. God ain't got no favorites. If he can do that in the Jerry Houston, and let me tell you, when I was a little boy, I, I had stage fright. If, you, if I stood before an audience, you said, boo, I would cry. <laughs> now, folk wish I would just sit down and shut up. 
But my point is, if God can do that in somebody like me, little old nappy head boy from Shreveport, Louisiana, didn't know nothing about his Bible, and look at what God has done. If God can take a young lady from Philadelphia in the hood where her daddy was a drug dealer, she was in the worst part of Philadelphia, and God can turn her life around and make her the champion that she is to speak to women, what do you think God can do in your life? God is just looking for some Davids who would just come down to the battlefield and see there is a need and let God use you to meet that need. Are there some champions in the house today? Is there somebody who will step out today and give your life to Jesus because you want to be a champion? Brother Houston, I've been thinking about it. I'm, I'm scared of crowds. And Brother Houston, I want to come down, but uh, listen, listen, you're not scared of crowds. You go to Walmart, <laughs> but there's a whole crowd of folk. You get in a line, where there's a whole crowd of folk waiting to check out. But the devil wants to fool you, make you think you're scared of crowds. And you will not step out and confess that Jesus is the Son of God because the devil got you thinking you're afraid of crowds. There's nothing anyone in this crowd want to do to you but see you saved. More so than anything, and you know that you need the Lord. I don't have to talk to you about faith because you wouldn't be here if you didn't have faith. I don't need to talk to you about repenting because I know you'd do that because to come to Jesus, you got to repent. The question is, will you be baptized? Brother, you said, I'm thinking about it, but I, I've been baptized before, and I don't believe in getting baptized a second time. Let me tell you something. If you were not taught right, the first time you got baptized, you just got wet. If you're taught wrong, you can't be baptized right. It takes the right teachings to give you the right plan of salvation. Go back and read Acts chapter 19, those 12 men at Ephesus. They only knew the baptism of John the Baptist. But when Christ's baptism was implemented, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, they had been baptized before in the John the Baptist. But John's baptism was obsolete. And if you have not been taught right, the baptism you were exposed to, it is illegal and obsolete. And the Lord is saying to you right now, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He even says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then maybe a child of God. I know you stood up before worship, during the elders' address, but since I've been preaching this lesson, maybe the Holy Spirit has convicted you that you need to rise up and be the champion that this church needs. Some of you all have left this church and now you're contemplating coming back. Now is a good time to come on back home. Now I don't believe in church hopping, but here's my attitude. If you don't think you can be saved at this congregation under my preaching, then you go to another congregation and that's where you feel like you can be saved, God bless you. I ain't mad at you, I just wanna see you get to heaven. But you can always come back home. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have problems with me. I'm not saying I'm not going to have problems with you. But sometimes we're going to rub one another the wrong way. But, you know, that's how iron sharpens iron. Sometimes iron got to rub against iron so iron can make iron sharper. So if you rub me the wrong way, that's all right. You're just smoothing out my rough edges, and I'm just smoothing out your rough edges so you can make me sharper, and I can make you sharper. I don't have no problem with having problems with you. Just talk to me about it behind closed doors or when you're on your knees. Now the message is yours. Who wants to be a champion? A champion in your home. A champion in this church a champion in your community who wants to step out of the status quo and start doing some things you've never done before. And let me tell y'all something. Dale Chris, if you want to keep on getting what you always got, just keep on doing what you always done, and you're going to end up with what you've always had. But if you ever want to go somewhere you've never 
been. You got to start doing some things you've never done. And you end up some places you've never been. Folks say, Brother Houston, that's thinking outside the box. No, it's not. We've just been in one corner of the box. The box is a whole lot bigger than the corner we've been in. And I'm just looking for some folk who don't mind going to another corner. Because this is a big box. Y'all got to learn how to praise the Lord up in here. Because when we praise the Lord, we run the devil out of here. We got to quit having church. And we need to start having some church. I'm through. Who wants to come to Jesus? Who wants to commit their life to the Lord? Who wants to be a better Christian? Who in the audience right now, you want to come to Jesus and you've been contemplating becoming a part of the church for a long time, but you've allowed negativity to keep you out? Let me tell you something. God loves you. Jesus came in this world and died for you. The Holy Ghost he wants to envelop you. The church has become God's shelter in the time of storm. And the word of God is our GPS. It's a navigational system that will lead us from earth to glory. But God can't save you if you don't come. There are some things God will do for us. But there are some things we've got to do for ourselves. Peter told them on the day of Pentecost, save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. See, when it comes to salvation, you got to do your part. God has already done his part. Jesus died, shed his blood, sent the Holy Ghost, gave us the word, set up the church. Grace and mercy is available to anyone who will accept it. That's God's part. Now you got to do your part. Come down here in faith. Repent of your sins. Confess him to be the son of God. And be baptized. You can't join this church. You can only be added. When you complete your obedience. And water baptism. We're going to be led in a song of encouragement. If you feel subject. Come as together we stand. And as we sing. Pass me not urgent. Will you come? Hey, oh, some champions, champions, come on. Come on, champions. My humble oh. cry. Any more champions, praise God, come on. On will and on why, well, Lord, others thou are Any champions coming? Anyone? On will and do, do not pass me. Will you come, one man, I'm one woman? Will you come? Will you come? Savior, Young people, we need oh, champions. Don't you Mother, sister, daughter, we need champions. Father, husbands, brothers, sons. Wow. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Your back. Don't let it pass. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Will you let me at thy throne? Don't let anything stand between you and Jesus. Will and find.